Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to our panel on incubating and accelerating global healthcare um, innovation. Um, thank you very much for, uh, for joining in. Um, my name is Jan van de Beek. I have the honor of moderating uh, this panel, and I'm joined by uh, four distinguished healthcare uh, leaders today to um, explore uh, this topic. Um, they are Julia Hagen, she's the Director of Regulatory and Politics at the Health Innovation Hub at the German um, Health Ministry. We have Sophie Park, she's a Chief Strategist at Bayer G4A Digital Health Partnerships. Um, Julia, Julia Belaya, she's a Global Head of Business Development for Health at the Plug and Play Tech Center. And finally, um, Ben Marutapo, he's the CEO of Sarah Care and also the co-fund founder of the NHS Innovation Accelerator. So um, welcome uh, to all of you. We're going to be discussing today kind of existing and also emerging opportunities and challenging along uh, the commercialization journey uh, for startups and, and how the different stakeholders uh, should support, um, especially early stage um, health tech startups um, and SMEs in the best way. Now, before we dive into the discussion, I would like to invite all the panelists to introduce themselves and to actually do that also not only by stating very quickly um, um, who you are, but also to share uh, with us uh, a very, in a very brief way uh, an achievement that you are personally really proud of uh, from the kind of last four to six months. And I will start with, uh, with Julia uh, to go first, please. Yeah, thank you so much, Jan Philip, and um, thank you for having me. Um, my name is Julia Belaya, and I um, lead the business development for the healthcare um, program at Plug and Play Tech Center. We're the largest startup investor and accelerator globally, uh, based out of Silicon Valley, but we have over 30 offices around the world, um, including here in Munich, Germany, where I'm based. Um, in the last six months, an achievement that I'm very proud of, in June, I actually had a baby. So on a personal level, I'm very proud of that. And he's, you know, kept him alive this entire time. Um, and then on, from a more professional view, um, this past June, actually, as well, we had um, one of our expos here in June, uh, here in Munich, where it's the um, kind of culmination of our three-month accelerator program. And this happened to be our batch five here in Munich, and we had the chairman of Roche um, uh, participate and say a few words, and uh, Roche Diagnostics was actually the partner that brought us out here to Munich um, as the first healthcare partner um, here in Europe. And um, to, you know, in the, a little over two years to have grown the visibility of this program, um, it's called Startup Creosphere in Munich, all the way to the top and have someone like the chairman um, of the entire organization um, speak at one of our events and just, you know, um, show the importance that um, the, the startup program and innovation is um, to Roche was um, very inspiring, you know, not just to the organization, but to everyone that's been involved in the journey. Thank you so much. And also thank you for sharing the uh, personal, very uh, great <laughs> story. Um, Sophie, continue with you, please. Thanks, Jan Philip. Hi, everyone. I'm Sophie, um, Chief Strategist for the G4A uh, Digital Health Partnerships Program here that's within uh, Bayer Pharma based out in Berlin. So we're a global accelerator um, and business development program for digital health companies specifically to partner directly with Bayer Pharma. Um, one of the achievements that I can share, you know, I'm sure all of you have something, you know, regarding COVID, but I think uh, from our team's perspective, you know, we've seen uh, the best of humanity and the worst of humanity, I guess, during the times of COVID and, and just sharing the best of it. I think, um, you know, we usually have this uh, yearly cycle, but we're fairly successful and it's, and it's really, it has been wonderful to see um, how fast digital health is actually growing and, and we see it in our applications and we see it in the different partners that come in through our deal flow. So that's been really exciting to see. So I would say that's kind of a, Thank a you. small achievement there. <laughs> Thank you, Sophie. Um, Julia, to Berlin, I guess, I suppose. Yes, thank you, Jan Philipp. So my name is Julia Hagen. I work at the Health Innovation Hub, um, which is the German Health Ministry's in-house think tank on digitalization. Um, personally, I'm, I'm very proud um, that um, together with the team at the Health Ministry and at the Federal Institute of 
drugs and um, medicine um, we managed despite COVID, despite a pandemic and of course a whole healthcare system under sort of a bit overwhelmed uh, we that we managed to launch um, the um, procedure for the reimbursement of digital health applications. So in the middle of the pandemic, um, the final adjustments, final criteria, et cetera, were developed so that um, uh, we were able to launch the procedure at the end of May. And that's something um, we were all very proud of uh, despite the circumstances. Great, thank you. Congrats. Ben, to flew the round, please. Hi, uh, yeah, and um, thanks very much for having me. It's great to join this, and um, I think really important topic the panel is covering. Um, so I'm a physician by background. Uh, I'm CEO of Seracare. We are a technology enabled home care provider and now one of the largest care companies in Europe after launching about three and a half years ago. I'm also co-founder of the NHS Innovation Accelerator, which spreads tried and tested innovations across our health system in the UK and benefited around three million people in its first six months. Uh, and I serve on the board of Imperial College Healthcare. Um, in terms of what, something I'm grateful for that's happened during COVID or proud of, I think at Sarah, so we look after predominantly older and vulnerable people. Uh, so many people with dementia, conditions such as stroke, uh, Parkinson's disease, and so on. Uh, and in this period uh, during the pandemic, we've delivered over a million, well over a million care sessions now. And despite that large number, we're fortunate that no people under our care have passed away due to COVID-19. Uh, this is important, particularly as 95% of uh, people globally who have passed away from the uh, infection and from the virus have been uh, older and above the age of 65. So that's something we're quite passionate about and we're keen to ensure that the people that we serve continue to stay well and healthy in their homes. Thank you so much. Thanks for sharing. And I think that this, uh, uh, leads us very uh, well into the, uh, the first part of the discussion. Um, and I would like to explore with you a little bit um, the how how COVID now um, uh, how that's impacting um, or has been impacting uh, your work. I think we've we all aware of the tremendous um, challenges uh, that it brings, of course, on the healthcare side, also on the economic side. At the same time, of course, I mean, the healthcare sector is part, uh, is part of the solution. There's a tremendous need uh, for innovation. We also see investment flowing into the sector, maybe also of new investors that are not so uh, well-versed potentially sometimes or knowledgeable or don't have a large track record in health. So all of that given, it also accelerates other trends, um, right, that we've seen before around digitalization, for example. Um, how does this, how do you see that impacting your, your work? How is maybe also your, your service portfolio, maybe in terms of supporting startups and entrepreneurs, been changed or affected? Um, Sophie, I want to start with you. Can you share uh, a few experiences or maybe also projections for the future? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, as, as we all know, you know, the first half of 2020, it's, it's been what, like over, I think, $5.5 billion, right? And I think that was the investment uh, volume that we saw this year. And I think digital health is doing really well, but I really want to be, you know, it's very important to also understand that, you know, technology plays a huge role in healthcare. But not only that, we've seen so far that there are huge gaps um, within health systems because of COVID. And I think people are, it's, it's amazing and refreshing to see that people are starting to realize that technology can be that bridge um, to, to, you know, connect the patients, you know, help physician workflow. I mean, when ERs are completely empty and zoned off, you know, these things like virtual waiting rooms, right? And, and I know that Ben, you probably also seen that as well um, through the NHS, but Going forward, I'm really hoping that at least from the monetary side, we, we're, we're, we're seeing an incline. <laughs> so I'm crossing my fingers that that's, that's where we're headed. Um, but it really, you know, for us, it's, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we've been working so closely with digital health companies in the past, uh, both young to, to early, early to mid stage. And we've seen that, um, you know, we offer the coaching and the mentorships that they need, but also the investments, co-creation opportunities. Um, and, and I think there's, there's a more need for that and there's a want for that, right? And so the demand is there and it's very exciting to see. And I think after this, we won't see it go down 
for example. I don't think we'll see a trough in that. I think it's going to be full on digital health. You know, we're ready. We're coming for you. <laughs> well, yeah, at the, um, I think it's plug and play kind of tech center. Is that also something that you sort of um, observe? How, how have things, um, how have things, evolved now and maybe also how have your have your services and ways of supporting um startups have they have they evolved or changed yeah so we have kind of a unique position at plug and play because we don't just look into the healthcare industry we're across industry so we look at 14 different industries some which have been completely crippled by covid like travel or automotive um, but us on the healthcare team have actually never been so busy. Um, our services have not stopped at all. If anything, I've seen that, you know, the, the same kind of focus areas that we've been pursuing with our partners um, in health, be it telehealth, point of care solutions, diagnostics, that, you know, prior to this crisis were kind of seen as a nice to have or, you know, a, kind of an add on to their traditional services have now been thrust to kind of the limelight. And this is where healthcare is going. And this is what, you know, whether you're a hospital or pharmaceutical company, um, where you need to go. And it's obviously thrust adoption of things like telehealth um, kind of to the forefront. And I don't think we're gonna be going back from that as, you know, as consumers and patients have gotten a taste um, for digitization within healthcare. Um, we have adapted our services um, to be virtual, like most companies have. Um, we do our, you know, traditional accelerator programs. These are uniform twice per year, three month programs that has gone completely virtual when prior to this, you know, a big part of our business is also real estate and co working spaces and logistical support and event spaces um, to really get people together in person, um, which has now moved virtually like the conference and the panel that we see today. Um, so, you know, we, we had to adjust to that very quickly. Um, but then on the flip side that has, you know, seen a lot more participation of our partners around the world. And um, we've been able to do a lot more cohesive events as plug and play with Silicon Valley, with Asia, um, you know, connect all the European countries and kind of take the burden off of the travel time um, and, and the money, you know, to actually go places together. So we've seen our services really accelerated and um, the, the deal flow and the interactions between our corporate partners and, and the startups have not slowed down at all. Thank you, Julia. Maybe one follow on question to, to, to you, uh, Julia, and also Ben with the asking for, for, for a brief answer. Um, do you think there's a risk of maybe an over acceleration or even an, um, is there a risk that things might, might go too fast and, and, and too much, maybe too much investment might be flowing too quickly? I don't want to be pessimistic. It's just a, um, a, um, just a question. Maybe it's a German question. I don't know. Julia, you're also German. Please. German answer to a German question. Um, well, I mean, I think it's usually healthcare professionals, patients a little less, um, they, they're hesitant about new technologies. Germans maybe even more, probably more so than, than other healthcare professionals. Um, at least that's an impression you get when you work in digital health in Germany. Um, and what we've seen with COVID is actually there was no other chance than adopting teleconsultation, adopting video and, and other digital solutions to actually con ensure continues, continuous care uh, for your patients. And all of a sudden, um, that's actually something we found out. We did a, we did a survey with, um, um, with uh, roughly 2,000 uh, physicians in Germany. And it turns out it's not as bad as they thought. So um, there's actually COVID was a great chance for that. They could experience that those technologies um, have a benefit uh, for, for their work and for their patients. So I think that's, that's good. Um, I'm, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know if there could be too much um, investment flowing into digital health. I, I think it's, it's good to, to get the funding that great solutions need and we need the competition and uh, then we'll see what kind of solutions uh, um, yeah. stick with patients and healthcare professionals. Ben, maybe it's your final perspective. Yeah, I mean, my first point would be that I think over the past five months, at least in the UK, we've seen more adoption and encouragement of innovation than perhaps over the past five years. 
uh, and that overall is to be welcomed. Um, I think there are some specific examples where we have tried to innovate, uh, but unfortunately the utilization of those new technologies or even new approaches uh, haven't been what we had hoped, be it, uh, I know in the UK there was originally thoughts around collaborations with Google and Apple to build a, a tracing app, um, which then became somewhat confused and we had to switch gears and change direction. Even in terms of building temporary hospitals, we built a number of temporary hospitals across the country to deal with the forecast demands of COVID-19, but then a number of those hospitals turned out to be empty during the peak of the first wave that we experienced. Um, but overall, I think the, the outcome and the result of accelerating innovation has only been positive. And there are a number of lessons we've learned from the policy changes that encourage innovation uh, in the right way, which hopefully will stay long after COVID-19 results. Very good. Thank you very much, Ben. Um, as you mentioned policy and policy change, let's, um, let's continue um, let's continue with that topic for a moment. I mean, the policy, the environment sort of is, of course, really important in, in, in which we are um, and you are providing incubation acceleration um, services. So let's have a look. Are there some examples of, um, let's say, policy innovation, innovation, innovative policies that can unleash also um, startup growth and, and give things a dynamic push? Um, Julia. Um, you work in that in that field. You're very close uh, to the ministry. Some things you might want to share here. Yes. Well, I think the the, the largest change that we have implemented in Germany is um, the possibility for digital health applications that are a medical device of a certain um, risk uh, class that they can be reimbursed by um, the statutory health insurance um, for all the. 73 million um, Germans or people insured in Germany. Um, that's, a, that's a real game changer because what we've seen um, in the past years is that there are, there are great, um, great innovative um, ideas in the field of digital health diagnostics, therapeutics, all kind of things. Um, however, they, they struggle to actually um, scale. And what we see is that they only have tiny contracts or fairly large contracts with individual health insurances. And um, well, that's that's already great, but it's about, um, it's about scale and about reaching all the patients that possibly need these kind of solutions. And for that, there's now a structured procedure uh, with uh, very clear uh, criteria that allows digital health um, solutions to be reimbursed. And there's even something that is sort of revolutionary that um, you can even join um, this, this scheme without having the final evidence, but sort of with pre preliminary results or hypotheses um, that you then are going to validate um, during 12 months of reimbursement. And after those 12 months, you need to then eventually deliver your results and uh, you will be continued to be reimbursed. So that's a real revolution. And there are a couple of other things that were implemented uh, with the Digital Care Act, for example, the possibility for health insurances, but also for, for physicians organizations to actually cooperate with um, um, businesses, other organizations in the field of digital health to develop um, solutions that might support um, some some medical need or some um, some problem that health insurances or physicians are now facing in um, in delivering um, care to their patients. So there's a lot of more possibility. That's what we see, and uh, now we hope that uh, this actually um, sees uh, the daylight as well. Super. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, thank you, Julia. Sophie, switching aside a little bit then um, to the startups that you are supporting and maybe that, that perspective, is it all as great as, as Julia said? Is everybody excited in the field um, about these opportunities that the new regulation provides? <laughs> um, actually, when uh, the announcement was made that Germany would now be passing that legislation, we did get a huge influx um, from a lot of startups uh, from the US actually um, asking us, you know, how they can participate, how, you know, what is needed, what evidence pathway do they need to build out. And so I think there is a lot of excitement for that. And it, it truly shows that, you know, once a government kind of takes a step forward and says, you know, this is something that's important. This is something that we need to integrate within our health systems. I think that 
you know, it says a thousand words. And so, you know, there are some certain things that need to be ironed out, I must admit. Um, but for the most part, at least from the startups that we've seen, um, they are excited. However, you know, there is the flip side. There are these hurdles, regulatory hurdles, it's tough, right? And um, for some of them, you know, it's not as easy, especially if you don't have enough capital, if you don't have enough, you know, team members, <laughs> to be honest, to, to drive a lot of these things and to run these clinical trials, it's very expensive. So, you know, there are two sides, but I would say for the most part, it is fairly positive. Good. Thank you very much. Um, to the UK, Ben, anything happening uh, in the NHS that um, should give all of us, uh, all of us Hope. So I think so when we launched the NHS Innovation Accelerator and we worked with entrepreneurs and innovators to try and identify the barriers they were having to achieving scale and success, I think two areas that really emerged quite consistently were one was navigation, working out which part of the health system to approach, which door to knock on so that you could find your customer, so to speak, and your go-to market strategy. And then the second part was procurement, essentially getting paid for your service or product. And I think to the uh, examples that we've had about in Germany, um, what we found quite effective in the UK uh, and in the NHS has been creating um, a national payment program that on an annual basis adds a number of new innovations and technologies, uh, be it devices uh, or digital products in a similar way to how uh, a hip replacement or even how a new medication would be added to our national price list, which empowers frontline staff to prescribe or to use those innovations and allow uh, patients to adopt them without necessarily being concerned or worried about if it will be paid for by the national health system and the payer. And that has, of course, enabled much greater scale for these innovators. Uh, and, and these respective startups. It's allowed them to focus their efforts in terms of how they can achieve a go-to-market strategy. But of course, and most importantly, it's really addressed some of the barriers at the front line that patients and clinicians would otherwise experience in getting access to the latest technologies. And that adoption piece, I think, is really important in healthcare because you can look at the app store where you've got 300,000 or so apps focused on health and wellness, but if people aren't using them, it's... Right. Bit pointless. So I think the more we can do to encourage adoption and to dissolve some of those barriers, uh, the more powerful those solutions can be. Super. So thank you very much. Thanks for these perspectives from both from Germany and the UK. I think that's really good, um, good examples also to see that things are um, indeed also evolving. Um, coming back a little bit now to the um, to the landscape of the also different services that that um, that you are offering to support um, to support startups. A general question: If you look at your own portfolio, or a bit look maybe also at the at the landscape now from an accelerators incubators kind of perspective, what are gaps? So, what are things that you believe? Wow, that's actually something that we should be doing, and we are not doing it now, or somebody else should be doing it. Um, Julia, maybe first first going to you. What 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 are things, or or is everything just just perfect, and we just got it all? No, no, <laughs> far from perfect, I'd say. Um, I mean, I think a, a gap that um, we, we've seen in healthcare that kind of precludes some of the very quick acceleration that we see in some other industries is the regulatory pathway. And if I had like a magic wand, it would be a way to be able to shorten that safely. It is, you know, patient lives are at stake. So we also don't want to um, flood the market with all of these um, solutions that are not going to be safe or helpful to the patient. But I think as much as we, you know, find the right solutions for our corporate partners. Hi. Um, there is the hurdle of, um, <laughs> of uh, having to go through the regulatory pathways still. Um, and then on the other side, also the reimbursement models. It, it's always been, you know, a global problem of who's going to pay for these solutions and neither the patients nor the providers um, feel like the burden should be on them. Um, so quickening these two um, kind of hurdles, I think, would be would do, you know, a, a lot within digital health. Okay. Um, um, so, and maybe 
expanding the question um, uh, a little bit. Uh, so if you are, if you're looking at startups at now that come to you and you had a magic stick, is there something that, um, that in some sense you observe things that you would change, would like them to change if you, if you could? Um, Julia, maybe a question for you. So is there, is there something where you would say, wow, um, by and large, if, if these guys did this or this sort of more or this or this less, um, success might be greater or come faster or the likelihood would be greater? Um, well, I mean, I think as, as Julia said, I can understand that businesses and especially startups want to shorten um, the, the regulatory procedures and, or, and limit the requirements to a maximum to as, as little as possible, of course. I mean, that's of course, from a regulator's perspective, very complicated because you gotta make sure that um, um, that patients are, are safe and that there's not going to be any harm from the um, digital health solution and there are not going to be any data breaches, especially in Germany, because that will be the end of your digital health solution. Um, but I think what I, what I experience is, especially now when I see that maybe also due to COVID, many people from the tech scene are moving into healthcare because they identify, oh, this is really cool and there's a lot to do. Um, so those uh, those people have a great knowledge in business and in technology. They come to healthcare, and um, then they have to realize. Well, it takes them usually quite a t quite some time to do that. They have to realize that the system is really complex, and it's very different depending on the country you're operating in. And um, and I think what what is really important is um, as a health startup, you you gotta understand what kind of problem you are solving and for whom, because you need to know who is going to pay in the end. If you cannot, if people who come to me, even on an informal basis, they pitch me a great idea and some really fancy technology, but they can't tell me whom they are providing this to or who is providing anything with their technology to anyone, then that's always difficult because that's something that you need to settle. Um, in the beginning, and it might be different depending on the country you're operating in, but that's something you you need to address. Right, Ben, you you mastered the journey. I think it's fair to say um, quite quite successfully. In hindsight, a little bit, um, is there something where you'd say that that would have been great to have when we were still early stage? Something where you say that's really missing somehow. Yeah, I mean, and there are many things I wish we had, we had more of or because there are many mistakes and lessons we've learned along the way in the quite a short journey so far. But what I would say is, firstly, I mean, building on Julia's point, I completely agree that it's so important to understand the problem. And many entrepreneurs skip that. It's very easy in healthcare to look at some of the numbers and how, si how big the problem or big the challenges are and how big the market is and get enthusiastic and build a product without actually really considering who's going to use it why will they use it? And if they actually will. Um, and working with, in our case, older people who are the people that we're serving at Sarah or our carers who are, and our caregivers who are the frontline members of staff for delivering these services uh, to understand what their specific product needs are and ensuring that that's woven into our technology. That's so important. And it took us a while, even though it's very obvious, it did take us a while to kind of catch on to that and really start incorporating it clearly and robustly into what we were building. Um, and I think the, the challenge in healthcare is that you can have misalignment of stakeholders. The person who is prescribing the technology or who's suggesting it should be offered can be different from the person who's using it, who in turn can be different from the person who is paying for it, who can be different from the person who's vetting it, who in turn is different from the person who's building it. So you have tremendous misalignment. It's not like building an iPhone where I'm sure half those guys uh, and who are the, the engineers behind it are probably building the, and using the products on a daily basis before it gets launched. Here you have, it is a mosaic of a landscape. And so creating that alignment and doing the work to understand where people are coming from and what they really need is, is so important. I think the, the other part that I would reflect on just on your previous question, which is where I think some of the gaps are in the landscape, uh, and I'm tremendously biased here, so I'll be honest, but it's a focus. I think in healthcare, actually, the people who are frequent flyers of healthcare products tend to be older people. If you look at most industrialized health systems, 
the biggest cost burden, disease burden is in, is in older people. And that has been reflected in by the COVID-19 pandemic. And actually, COVID-19 has predominantly affected people from certain ethnic backgrounds as well. How do we bake that into the technologies and products that we are launching and creating? Because sometimes, again, it can be a quite a jazzy new intervention or innovation, which many millennials may want to use, including myself. But will that move the needle for a payer or an insurance company? Will it actually change the cost curve? Will it affect the people who are consuming the majority of healthcare resources? That's a question that remains to be answered. So I think there should be arguably a greater focus on groups which sometimes may be neglected, older people or people from other backgrounds as well, as I touched on. And I think their user experience needs need to be focused on to a greater extent as well. Thank you, Ben. And I think, uh, thank you for this uh, very structured way of outlining these complexities and challenges there. Sophie, now turning to you, how do you, how do you help startups navigating and that that space so this the complexity on on you know focusing on those that really have the problem engaging those that 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 have that problem even if it might be difficult and maybe not the target group that is closest to you at that moment how 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 you get them on on target to to help them to get and stay on target to increase their chances for for success um, so for us at G4A, you know, at being a part of a large pharmaceutical company, there's a lot of different expertise that we're also able to bring in um, internally from, you know, medical affairs to public affairs to, you know, R&D to devices, regulatory. But aside from that, remember that, you know, as a pharmaceutical company, those are very different um, thresholds, right, of, of regulation that we go through for, for drug manufacturing. But when we look at digital health companies, you know, we always say, you know, we offer expert mentorship, et cetera. But what that really means for us is we look at it from a very bespoke perspective because we understand that each, you know, as Ben just said, each startup company is very different. You know, they're either, you know, um, looking directly to go to go directly to patients, you know, their go-to-market strategies are go either going directly to payers. So they're very different. And so some of the things that we do offer is a bespoke, bespoke service where we bring in experts um, who work closely with the FDA um, to understand, you know, what are some of the regulatory pathways that some of these companies need to overcome. We also bring in, you know, for, for European companies, GDPR standards, right, for a lot of companies that are outside of, of Europe that come in um, and really understanding what kind of pathways and what um, solutions do they need to build and structure their company app software etc um, in order to be able to scale in whatever country um, that they're coming from and remember we're not only bringing com uh, companies into Germany to scale within Germany uh, but we are bringing a lot of various digital health companies so it's not really a one-fit solution but everything from evidence pathway to business development to you know strategy even executive coaching guys <laughs> we, we we do have uh, some companies that come in right um, where we will need to sort of say hey have you thought about hiring another ceo and these are really tough decisions to make but you know as as g4a we do um we do a wide variety of things for our companies okay Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Um, let's move to the to the last kind of uh, topic of our um, discussion here. And I want to look at um, and I want to look at, at scaling with you. So leaving a little bit the the kind of early stage domain um, and and considering some of the most recent um, cases, um, especially now during COVID times. Uh, BioNTech, uh, but also CureVac, um, um, a German-based company um, that now IPO in the US um, um, with an um, extraordinary, uh, extraordinary valuation, raises the maybe a bit, little bit provocative question. Um, are we, is Europe an incubator um, for the US? Is that our our role when we look at um, when we look at um, at global healthcare views on this, maybe Sophie, you got something. 
I can, I can say something off the record. <laughs> in my personal opinion, in my personal opinion, no, I don't think um, it's very easy to see Europe as some sort of an incubator or an accelerator for digital health companies, but I don't think that's correct at all. Um, you know, because just with capital investments and investment volume wise, you know, France as a country is the second largest in investments to digital health after the US. So I really don't think um, uh, it, it's, it's, it's an incubator of any sort. Um, and when you see where, here's the thing, when you see a, a fractured healthcare system, it's easy to find ways to capitalize on that situation. I'm gonna put it that way. Whereas you focus on Europe and a lot of these countries have a set healthcare system that's very stringent there's a lot of regulations and rightfully so you know you don't want to give patients you know a random app that hasn't you know been approved to manage their type 1 diabetes i don't know but you know there's there's always these regulations and to be honest um i think the opportunity is now uh, for Europe, especially after COVID, you're seeing that people are a lot more open to adapting technology and you also, you don't see it just in the US, you see it around the world, actually. And I think this is a huge wake up call. Um, and with that, there's a huge opportunity in Europe, I would call it an opportunity. Um, rather than just, you know, there are big investors in the US agreed. Um, but in terms of scale, um, the Europe, European countries definitely have, uh, have a lot of power behind them. Okay, maybe um, two final views on this. Um, so how do we then, so I'm too pessimistic, I, am, I understand that, so um, the problem may not be as great. Um, so how do we capitalize on that opportunity then, if it's here, if it's now? Um, Julia, you have a, have a view on that? How do we grab the opportunity that Sophie described? I mean, for, for us, we are, you know, a Silicon Valley based company with all these global offices. But what I see with startups is I do understand kind of the, um, the attraction of the US when you are kind of past the growth stage of, you know, the early stage and are looking to scale just because you are able to capture a much larger market. When here in Europe, what we see is, you know, even all of the progress that you make in, say, France does not exactly make you any more prepared to enter a new market like Germany. So you have to kind of start from scratch every time you're trying to scale in a new country and maybe, you know, with, with a little bit. Um, uh, and I, I think with Europe is progressing in the fact that there is some more, you know, uh, countries working together to make this easier. Um, I do think that there's a lot of opportunity for companies in the early stage and investors are seeing that the valuations are more fair here in Europe. I've read that companies um, start up spend a lot less money, um, about 70 cents to the dollar that they do in America. Um, and I think that they are, you know, investors are seeing this as an opportunity, but then from a startups growth perspective. I do still see, or a lot of companies that come through our programs um, are attracted by the Silicon Valley piece and the uh, mentorship and the connections we have there when they actually do want to grow and scale and get the number of customers going there. So I think, I mean, one piece is making it easier, I think, in Europe. Um, and, and this is difficult with different, different, different um, healthcare systems, different infrastructures, but for a company to be able to, you know, kind of capitalize on the work that they do in one country to get a leg up on entering um, another EU country. Very good. So there is a there is a piece of work there. I think also for internationally active um, accelerators and incubators to, to maybe help that. Um, building these kind of these kind of bridges and connecting the different uh, different ecosystems. Very good. Okay, so um, as we are now sort of approaching um, uh, the, the conclusion of this panel, um, I would like to conclude um, this with a round. And first of all, thank you um, to all of you for uh, for contributing. It has been um, has been wonderful, very insightful. And I would like to to conclude by asking each of you in a very to end with it, asking for a short answer, um, what you have learned uh, from this panel and what you are, what you're kind of taking, uh, taking with you. And I'm starting uh, with Julia in 
Berlin. Thank you. Um, well, I think I'm excited to hear that you all share the idea that this is a great time for digital health, that we all share the feeling that so finally it's it's really ramping up to something that becomes a reality for for many many patients um in our healthcare healthcare systems i think that's something that i that i take home and that i'm very happy about because um that's really what we want to do with um the regulatory reforms in germany as well we want to attract great digital health solutions from all over the world um, so i think that's great to hear thank you ben what do you take from here? I think, I mean, if we look at our panel, we have people from different vantage points, different countries, different backgrounds, um, and yet there's remarkable convergence and similarities between our views. And I think it's great to see that people across healthcare are now galvanized in kind of their efforts and views of what the future looks like, both in terms of its gaps, but also the real opportunities that technology now has to revolutionize the care that's delivered. That of course gives me a lot of hope as an entrepreneur, but also I think it demonstrates that the opportunity now really is global and COVID has leveled some of the playing field, making talent collaborations and of course the need for healthcare uh, that's digitally driven, um, international and global in nature. Thank you. Sophie, your learnings. Yeah, so I mean, not much to add after Ben, but I, I do have to agree, you know, with COVID, you see the work that digital health entrepreneurs, investors and player has put and players and hospital system and payers have put into the last, you know, 10, 15 years, that's finally materializing in a way where, you know, four people from very different areas, same industry, you know, somewhat, but for very different functional areas, all kind of agree right that you know now is the time and and it really it, it really does give me a lot of hope um and i think that that it's that it's really great and i still believe that there's a lot of opportunity in europe <laughs> we all do i do as well uh thank you sophie uh julia conclude with you yeah i want to thank everyone you know my my co-panelists and um kind of echo what everyone said it's great that you know this unfortunate pandemic has really pushed kind of innovation in healthcare to the forefront something that we've all been working for you know for for years and it's kind of the time is now and i think it's exciting that it has really accelerated some much needed changes um like the reimbursement system within germany and uh very proud you know to be based in munich and all of the work that's been done here so excited to see that kind of you know scale um globally as well Super. Um, thank you very much. That concludes our panel on incubating and accelerating uh, global healthcare innovation. Thank you, Sophie. Uh, thank you, uh, Julia, Ben, uh, and Julia. It was a pleasure to have you. Thank you very much, um, Alex X, um, Alex X for, uh, for, for, for hosting this. Um, and well, I hope um, you've enjoyed this conversation. Um, feel free to be in touch uh, with the panelists afterwards. And um, this concludes it. Thank you very much and goodbye.